In a world where technology and sustainability are becoming increasingly intertwined, how can organisations harness the power of things like generative AI to not only revolutionise their operations, but also spearhead their sustainability initiatives? Well, today I want to dig deep on this question with Sereni Kushik, President of Technology and Sustainability and Global Head of Foundry for Generative AI at Rackspace. He's a great guy. He's got over two decades at the helm of tech innovation, and he also brings with him a wealth of knowledge on the transformative power of AI and its pivotal role in the intersection of technology and sustainability. So from that rapid evolution of generative AI workloads to the strategic opportunities and the challenges of of adopting these technologies... Today's guest is going to offer his invaluable insights, and together we'll explore how generative AI is set to reshape industries with the same vigour as the mobile revolution, but only quicker. And also explore the crucial skills for the future workforce, how we ensure that nobody gets left behind here, and some of the innovative strategies for talent acquisition in the age of AI. Now, before I get today's guest on, a quick shout out to the sponsors of Tech Talks Daily, because in today's remote first world, I think settling for outdated managed file transfer solutions means ultimately you're risking your sensitive data. But if you upgrade to KiteWorks, the gold standard in secure MFT, boasting FedRAMP moderate authorization, KiteWorks isn't just secure, it's a complete transformation of how your business handles file transfers and the communications. And with this state-of-the-art file sharing, email security, and and a platform that's as robust as it is user-friendly, KiteWorks is empowering you to manage and protect your data like never before. So say goodbye to compromise and hello to unmatched security and efficiency. And you can do that by making the switch to KiteWorks.com. Visit KiteWorks.com to begin. That's KiteWorks.com to secure your data and empower your business. But now, let's get today's guest on. So buckle up and hold on tight, because no matter where you're listening in the world, I'm going to beam your ears all the way to the US, where we can talk about all this and much more. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell everyone listening a little about who you are and what you do? First of all, it's a pleasure to be on the show. Uh, I am uh, Srini Kaushik. I'm the president for AI, technology and sustainability at Rackspace. Wow, it's an incredibly cool job title and two of the biggest words that people are talking about at the moment, AI and sustainability. And I also suspect that both of those words, businesses know that they need to get involved with both of them. But equally, it can be a little bit daunting on where do they begin? How mm-hmm. do they make sure they don't get left behind? So to set the scene for our conversation today, and I appreciate this is a pretty big question, but how can organizations pragmatically integrate AI into their sustainability initiatives to create that tangible and measurable impact that they're looking for? Yeah. So first of all, I think um, AI, uh, especially generative AI, since it's it's come in over the last year or so, um, has kind of been pretty much, you can't start a conversation without talking about AI. Yeah. And uh, the reality is, like, when you kind of looked at the first six or seven months of, uh, of that whole wave, a lot of people were, uh, you know, I call it, they were building toys. And so mm-hmm. constantly, let me convince it myself that it's there. I think we very quickly moved beyond that to say, how do I industrialize AI in an organization, right? Uh, it, meaning, how do I actually embed it into my business processes? How do I make sure that that uh, it is adding the value that it's purported to add? Uh, and so, like, uh, going through that, it, 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 through that journey has been uh, really interesting. And the way we advise people is, first of all, if you're going to implement it pragmatically, make sure you understand what responsible AI is for you, right? And Because I, I think it's, it's very critical that organizations implement AI in a way that's responsible to society and consistent in their values, like in, a, in their organization's value, consistent with that. And I think it starts there and it starts establishing that framework and the guidance and the governance you actually need to be able to drive AI. And what I've seen is like, you know, I've been in this industry for 30 plus years. 
And uh, unlike any other technology, the maturity on this is evolving very, very rapidly. The regulations are catching up. The, uh, the guidelines for what you can build and what you can't use and all of those things are shaping up. So the organizations that are adopting AI have had to move uh, very, very rapidly. And when you're moving at that speed, uh, a healthy level of pragmatism helps, right? Because you don't want to re rework and redo things. 100% with you. And it was interesting you mentioned there that the last six, seven months, or the six, seven months last year when everyone was going crazy over generative AI. And it felt, to me, you said everyone was building toys, and it reminded me of not the iPhone moment, but the App Store moment. Remember when mobile apps first yeah. came out? Yeah. All anyone was building was turn your phone into a, um, a, a pint of beer, into a chainsaw, <laughs> into a musical instrument. It was just toys. And then yeah. little by little, businesses started um, producing things that would make an impact to their business. But I, I'm curious, here we are in 2024. What are the most exciting new trends that you're observing in generative AI workloads? And how are they, they shaping the future of business technology? Because it feels like this is where the magic starts to happen. It is a fantastic analogy to compare it to the App Store, uh, yeah, because I, I still remember like you know, hey, pick up your phone and shake it, and this happens, or like you can, it, it's like oh, it looks like a beer, I can drink it. <laughs> you had all kinds of apps coming out, and I, I think uh, we went. The, the only difference with the uh, generative AI trend is we went through that very quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. We went through it very quickly because the technology exists to be able to go drive that. So, so I think. Um, but, but the, the, you know, as these new things come out, there's still, uh, I, I'll go back to some of the key things that, that I've learned through this that have, still apply here. Yeah. Um, Steve Jobs and others, like, you know, talk a lot about user-centered design, and user-centered design is all about three things, like desirability, feasibility, and viability. And when you can move, it, it, when you can find the right intersection between those three things, you end up with a product that's killer or a solution that's killer. With AI, what we see is the potential is tremendous. So you have the boards, uh, boards of organizations, senior executives wanting to use AI because they know that it's a competitive advantage. So the desirability exists today, right? Now, if I move over to the that feasibility component of it, the hyperscalers, the tech, the, the uh, bond providers have built tech and they are releasing new capabilities every single uh, you know, weak, I would say, right? And then there's new large language models coming out that your um, the feasibility of solutions becomes more and more uh, easier to do. So the, from a business standpoint, where we're actually running into issues right now is the viability, right? Meaning if I if it's desirable and if I can build it, can it deliver the uh, the benefits that I expected it to? Right? Uh, and and that's where uh, a lot of the organizations we work with are kind of looking at this going, wait, uh, we built the solution. If I now put it in, is it going to deliver the productivity enhancements that we talked about? Is it going to, you know, the, you, the standard pitch, um, generative AI is going to enhance creativity, improve productivity, <laughs> you know, increase like, you know, the, 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 those things you go and say, okay, great. Will it enhance creativity? Will rolling out something like um, Copilot enhance creativity? Because if it doesn't, then it's just an added cost in your stuff, right? And, and it's, yeah. it's, it's a cool toy and, and others. So a lot of it is now shifting over to how do I get the organization to learn and adapt? From a technology standpoint, what's happening is, uh, it, well, the costs of these solutions are still pretty high, right? You know, it, it's evolved very quickly, but the uh, the price points haven't yet dropped to the level where these business cases start making sense. Uh, for the large organizations who have it and for those handful of use cases that the value is delivered, we're going ahead and implementing that. But a lot of other customers are coming back and looking at it and saying, okay, we built this, this is good. But if, in order for me to deploy it into production, it's going to cost me X amount of dollars or pounds. And is does it have an ROI in in uh, in 2024? Does it have an ROI in 2025? Sadly, the answer is for the most cases you look at it and go, yeah, not yet. And the costs have to drop a little bit more on that front to be able to do that. And the costs will only drop 
when you start evolving from these large language models that people are using for generative AI into more tailored, small language models, because running the inference on a daily basis takes time, takes compute power, takes all of those uh, those things that uh, require the solution to work. So I think this, the shift and, and the workload shift that we're seeing is like, first of all, it's exciting because the things that are going through all those gates are the ones that truly add value. So that's great. Like you're not building that app where you're drinking, a, it looks like you're drinking a beer or something like that. You're actually building those valuable uh, solutions for it. And as we do that, you see the whole conversation around uh, language models and how is it, is a large language model better or a smaller language model that's focused on on a p- particular domain better for a solution. And we were mentioning a few moments ago there how generative AI is being compared to that swift rise of smartphones and mobile <laughs> apps over the years. But how do you see generative AI maybe similarly revolutionizing industries in the years ahead? Is there anything that you see taking shape there or, or any predictions? Uh, well, I I absolutely do believe that it will change things. Like, again, but I, I, not to belabor that, uh, that the, the analogy that you used, um, in order for the iPhone and the apps to be valuable, you had to kind of go in and embed it into your digital transformation efforts. You had to embed it into processes, and it couldn't be something that sat next to it. It had to be embedded into it. Right? You know, I, I still remember like the past the toys, like the first wave of digital transformation was, hey, we've got a digital solution. And I would ask uh, our some so of the people who work, what, what, what solution did you put in? Well, we've got this thing where uh, we get faxes from our branch offices. We pick up the fax and then we scan it into a digital <laughs> thing so that it can actually go through that. You know, better, but not the solution you want. You actually want to embed it in into your solutions. And that's kind of where AI and generative AI are coming up. We are seeing. We've got some really forward-looking guys who are, who are taking a look at it and saying, I need to generate an investor memo. 80% of the investor memo or 90% of the investor memo is the same, but it takes us a lot of time to do the research to, to be able to go go that. Let me use generative AI to create it so that the expert that I've got is really adding their value to it. So it's a human augmented type of a solution that comes up. Those are becoming more and more common today. And what that really means is it actually shifts you away from the day-to-day toil uh, of of going out and doing that research and do that and and just to throw an analogy of mine uh, into it, I call it we're with generative AI in business is going to help us move up the Maslow's hierarchy because most businesses spend a lot of time on food, shelter, clothing, right at the at the bottom of the Maslow's hierarchy, basic needs, right? You know it, it, the the manual labor thing that has to be done the. Uh, the quality checks that have to be executed because of the manual intervention. And, and that's a lot of time spent by many organizations. Gen AI is going to move us up. So like just like human beings moving towards self-actualization, I think business businesses are going to, uh, to uh, really start thinking about how do I completely change um, uh, you know, some of our uh, the, the processes. 100% with you. And I think it's important to remember that we have been here before. I mean, the last 18 months, generative AI is already beginning to reshape the business landscape, which means we will lose some traditional business roles, but equally, there'll be many, many more jobs that come too. And if we look back, I think I Googled this recently, jobs that didn't exist 20 years ago. And there is a long list of job roles that we all take for granted now, from social media manager, managers to cloud engineers, data scientists, et cetera. So we know the workplace will evolve, but I suppose for business leaders, the big question is, what are those key skills and competencies that they should be looking for from their workforce? Yeah. What should they be focused on developing? And how important are reskilling and upskilling? Yeah. Uh, and then showing that we don't leave people behind here too. Yeah. yeah. So first of all, I I, I think that it, it's a very good question. I'll be very clear and say, this is the way I, I look at the skills landscape going forward, right? You know, yeah. I it's maybe what something that many people disagree with, right? But I think where where this is headed is number one within within technology, right? When you kind of think about those roles, um, 
I think it, there there is a shift away from STEM coming, uh, coming which is, uh, I think if you kind of use that Maslow's hierarchy, food, shelter, clothing, I had to program it. I need to do it, deal with it. If I'm going to build an AI model, how do I get the data scientists who can actually go and build the right type of regress to model or a classification model and understand what type one and type two errors are? There's a ton of things that you had to do that was just playing at the bits level. And so you actually needed uh, a lot more step. Right? As you move up that Maslow's hierarchy, you're starting to use higher level cognitive functions like creativity, right? And yeah. problem solving. Uh, and the ability to kind of, uh, uh, you know, understand something, comprehend what's being said, and then move on to that next step. And I think those are areas where traditionally underutilized uh, areas like uh the liberal science and arts they, they are in the U.S. we call it LSNA, but it's it's you know English, right? How do you communicate those those fields uh, have not participated in this technology boom? I believe yeah. there, there's an opportunity. So it also has implications on uh, technology teams and HR organizations because what you're looking for should change, right? Because <laughs> it's, it's that the thing that's going to help most people it, it, that most people in the space is. This technology is moving so quickly that I tell my HR leads and others, if somebody tells you they're an AI uh, the AI expert, run the other direction because they don't know what they're talking about. Because like, you know, I'm in it every day and I can tell you I'm barely adequate in this space at the speed at which this is moving. Uh, and so like the reality is then let the technology evolve and what can organizations do on top of it? You can actually leverage your creativity and, and uh, the things to be able to interact with AI. But it also means that if you're going to bring in people back to your reskilling and retooling, you have to raise AI literacy amongst everyone in the company. Um, when we started this journey back in uh, uh, May of last year, uh, I introduced within Rackspace a program called Fair Learn. Fair is founded for AI by Rackspace, is our AI uh, you know business unit out there. And as we did that, we introduced something called Fair Learn, and it was a curriculum that was built and with four levels, starting with uh, AI aware all the way to an AI expert, leveraging tools and um, uh, you know a, 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 a training that was already out there. We set ourselves what we thought was a very aggressive goal of trying to get 60% of rack space, at least to that first level of awareness by the end of the year. We got there, we got to about 85% and we're knocking on 100 right now. Yeah. This includes everyone. It includes our administrative assistants. It includes our CEO. It includes me. All of us had to go through it. Some of us went like higher up in that education, but everyone was at AI literate level. And the reason we do that is when you industrialize AI, AI becomes an employee in your organization. And, you know, this is very important. Um, and if you're going to bring AI solutions into your organization as an employee, as a competent employee that can do a task or a set of tasks very well, you've got to be able to train AI how to work with the people, but vice versa, you got to train the people how to work with AI and collaborate with it so that you can raise that uh, that level. So it's a uh, it's a fascinating, but it's a, such an exciting area to do it because um, we'll, I know we'll talk about sustainability uh, later. But but uh, economic sustainability and and being able to do it in an equitable way requires that you bring everybody along, right? I happen to be one of those really uh, fortunate ones that like people call are the either the 10 percenters or one percent or whatever it is right because i was lucky enough to participate in the technology boom uh, but but others like that i grew up with and others did not have that opportunity because they didn't come into the space um you can't have ai widen income gaps you can't have ai widen all of the societal issues that we already have today and I think it's critical that we take the time to bring people along, whether it's within your organization or outside of that. 100% with you. And in terms of talent acquisition, what shifts are you anticipating as companies increasingly adopt generative AI? How should they adapt their hiring strategies to attract the right talent for these new tech uh, changes too? And I agree with you, as you're saying, there's skills there. There's so many areas 
that technology can take care of. It can remove robotic, mundane tasks. But yep. the thing, yep. but it's human skills, strategy, creativity, problem solving, innovation, communication, collaboration, all those great things we are as humans. That's what we can bring to the table. But but what do you see here? Well, I I, I think I, I talked about it uh, that briefly as part of a previous answer. But like, look, I I think the the near future. Uh, the workforce is going to be made up of humans and AI. Right? Yeah. You know, AI solutions, some AI solutions you built for your company, some AI solutions you're buying from other partners like Salesforce or Microsoft or any of those things. But if you if the workforce is made up of humans and AI, the values of the company should be reflected in both of those. Right? How you actually interact with one another and the collaboration that needs to happen uh, happens in that space as well. And uh, there's also uh, the the whole like the wrinkle in this whole thing is like with this new hybrid model of work, right? You know, in the past everybody was coming into work and you were able to kind of learn, talk to each other. And others these days, uh, it's it's some mixture, right? Either you work completely from home or you're coming into work only a couple of days a week. Um, it presents some very very interesting challenges because you mentioned those higher level skills. That's what we've got to hire. Um, but I've got a, a a daughter who's 26 years old. She graduated in 2020, right right when the pandemic was going on. Um, she has never worked in an office. Mm. But, and and uh, that I give her a lot of credit because she said, like, Dad, I'm going to quit and join some place where I'm actually required to come in for three or four days. Because they really struggle to make those connections. They struggle to... Uh, the people like us who had the uh, the uh, you know the benefit of working in both places, we can try to adapt. But this mm-hmm. next generation workforce that's coming in, we've got to figure out how we uh, bring them in, uh, get them familiar with uh, this. Training them on using AI is going to be easy, right? you know, because they they're already coming in with it. But how do you make sure that you get that human connection? Is is a part of it. So we in, in our HR, uh, our chief HR officer, like uh, Kelly, is top notch, right? Then she comes in and says, like, first of all, from an AI standpoint, she's like, Trini, how do I get to use AI uh, tomorrow in my recruiting processes? So we did the initial things for her, which is if you have a job description and you have a resume, feed it into our solution, and it will give you the uh, interview questions you have to ask. Right, you know that that person based on your job description and the resume of the candidate. Can I, uh, it, you know, it, it just asks you that the, the the questions, and you can refine the questions. It's like, oh, but but I need to use uh, 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 this person is going to be joining our public cloud organization, and they are looking for these two or three things. The questions get refined, and what it does is it allows you to kind of have a much better interaction with the uh, thing. It saves people time because when I get a call saying, Sri, can you do a interview? Right? Um, I have those questions already there in front of me uh, instead of me having to write it down. So our HR team has been pretty forward-looking in terms of how they do that. They have an interactive chatbot called Ask HR and others. And, and now what we're trying to do, and they pioneered this whole AI learn, the fair learn uh, component of it, taking it through. We're, we're starting to say, okay, this future workforce, what are the... Uh, skills and capabilities that we have to give them, right? For for people who've been here uh, um, for a long time, how do we get them more familiar with AI? For someone who's just out of college and, and coming in, how do we get them to, uh, you know, work in this environment where, like, it's a true hybrid environment with humans and AI? How do we actually go out and build that? Um, and just, like, it's early days. We've launched a leadership academy uh, where we're taking, uh, you know, but the first cohort I'm running is about 40 people through it. And the 40 people have, uh, it's a mix of about 10 or 12 of them are new to the company. And then uh, there are several that have been here for a long time. And we're actually taking them through these individual things. We have a session coming up where we'll, uh, we'll actually get them to interact with uh, with Claude Right, you know, and uh, and you know, they, we we don't use ChatGPT, but we use Claude from Anthropic. Like you know, just we're going to give them an exercise to get them to get go learn. Right? Like you know, here's an exercise. Uh, let me see you use Claude. 
right, to come up with the uh, with an answer. And it's we, in the trial runs we've done. It's been fascinating because like it, it, they all have heard the noise. They all heard this, but once the once you get to use it hands on and you get the training saying. Yeah, you could try to uh, changing your prompt this way, right? And see the answer and what it what comes out. I start lighting up, and they're kind of, oh, cool! I can use this in my job, right? And it's no longer a fear that AI is going to take over your job. It's a oh, I can see how I can evolve my uh, my thinking to it, and it also gives us an opportunity to come back and say, by the way, that last answer you got, that's not your final answer. <laughs> that's your first draft. Right, like so, you would use that as your first draft, and then add your human touch to it. Right, so so it gives them a way to, you know, hands-on way interact with AI, right, in the day-to-day uh, setting, and uh, get more comfortable with it. So many great points there. I'm curious I, for any business leader listening that are dipping their toes in the water or trying to navigate these uncharted digital waters for the first time. I, do you see any other strategic opportunities and challenges that those those businesses might face when they're adopting generative AI? And, and any tips or advice on on how they should be navigating it? Well, I I do believe that um, any business leader um, adopting AI should not take a technology first approach. Right? They should take. And I I think first of all, I'd say AI is real. Like. The world, you know, all the, it's not hype, right? All the positive aspects of AI are absolutely true. And all the negative side is also true. So it's it's kind of like, you know, you, it can be, it can go either way. The only way we make sure that the good AI or the responsible AI wins is by getting the organization aligned to those values, right? You know, and, and to do that, it's just like anything else. It's a habit that has to be built. And the way we, uh, I told by the people, you work for a company, we will throw right space. Our values are very clear, right? We're a customer first company. We, uh, we are, like, we have technology in our DNA. Like, you know, so, so our values are clear. So our approach to responsible AI was shaped by our values. And so what that means is uh, if, if I have a solution that doesn't meet our value, we're going to say no. We're going to walk away, right? If if we can't, uh, if if uh, the large language model of a particular company that we're using, and you look at that company and you see their values and it doesn't align with yours, probably not a good idea to use that and bring it in, right? In in, in dear in dear company. So, business leaders taking that approach. And being very pragmatic about it, I like love the pragmatic word you used at the start, pragmatic about it so that you're balancing that desirability, feasibility, and viability will allow you to kind of bring AI in, in a very um, bland and um, in a way that the organization can can embrace the change as opposed to resist it. And so that's, that's kind of what my, my uh, advice would be. I would also say most business users should get their AI literacy up, right? You know, don't rely on others to be able to tell you that. You need to do that. If not for your business, do it for your personal life, right? because it's <laughs> this is this is everywhere these days, right? And and it's uh, it is so important that people get uh, get up to speed on this because um, you know you need to be able to discern what's right and what's wrong, right? And that that whole critical thinking. Um, if you just accept what AI is telling you at face value, you're going to kind of create these bubbles of things like that just increase the divides, right? And so, so I think I, we we uh, we use this term in every one of my presentations. I say we're doing AI because we want machines to be better machines, so that humans can be better humans. <laughs> so that's. That's the core of uh, how why we want to do that, and I think that's good advice for most uh, business owners, uh, owners uh, considering AI. And I must admit, as the overcautious XIT guy, I, I do find myself saying sometimes, "Hey, let's cool our jets. We've seen what happens when you move fast and break things. We need to start thinking about ethical considerations, governance, and and all those boring IT kind of stuff, which is so important." So. How should organizations approach those ethical considerations and governance needed to ensure that responsible use? Yeah. 
So um, I'll tell you how we are advising our customers to do it, right? And and so so um, first of all, for us, responsible AI comes down to three things. You'll see me use this three all the time, right? And then uh, because it comes down to three things. For AI to be responsible, number one, it has to be symbiotic with human beings. Number two, it has to be secure. And number three, it has to be sustainable, yeah. right? And and those three S's are informed by the values of the company, right? It, for us, as an example at Rackspace, symbiotic means we're going to use AI to augment our rackers and, and uh, the, the capabilities, not replace them. Right again, it may prevent me from ha- ha- you know uh, it, it may give me the opportunity to not hire uh, additional folks right because the productivity improvements are there. But if we're creating something, we have to make sure that if it's replacing somebody's job, how do you get that person moving upward right into that piece? So the symbiotic component is important to us. Secure um, is really at the core of it. Who has access to what information uh, is personal information protected, uh, all of those things. And not just that, are we meeting the rules and guidelines established by the EU, right? And and by the various regulatory agencies coming out, that's where the secure component comes in. And then the sustainable piece of it has two parts. Uh, sustainable is like it's uh, AI for sustainability and the sustainability of AI, right? The yeah. AI for sustainability is where you're using AI to kind of help you uh, go through all of the uh, the reporting and the accuracy work that you, you the accuracy that you have to have in terms of carbon reporting, carbon at uh, the neutral reporting and other it's a ton of data coming in from multiple sources. It's a very labor intensive approach, but if, if I can use AI to kind of guide that uh, and how we uh, collect information, process it, aggregate it, and report on it. That's the AI for sustainability component of it. And again, clearly, there's many use cases. If I'm, if I was working in the weather meteorological department, then I'd be using it to understand the data better and uh, start doing better predictions. But that's AI for sustainability. But the sustainability of AI part of it is today it's it's an area that's a gap because any AI solution that you put in uh, consumes a lot of energy. Right. And it actually works against what you're doing. Yeah. But if you're if you're uh, cautious about what applications you're building, what solutions are you building, and do it in a way that uh, meets those other responsible AI components, then you can make the best of a bad situation. Right? And that's that's kind of the way I, I put it. And then what's happening, though, is what's exciting about the technology developments in this space is we've been interacting with a couple of different, like, you know, you had the biggest uh, GPU maker had their had their conference like a couple of days ago. Um, but when you have uh, uh, this type of an opportunity, there are so many people. I spent time with a company a couple of days ago where they were talking about uh, running these instances with 40% less, uh, 40% of the power used by today's top, I think. So... There's work going on to say, how can I deliver the same uh, or better processing power with more efficient chips that that really more sip electricity and kind of heating and cooling as opposed to do that. So I think that will uh, th- that technology is going to evolve very rapidly. Uh, again, you see the size of the market. So there's a lot of investment that's gone into uh, into getting that. So I think responsible AI for us, again, is back to symbiotic, secure, and sustainable. Uh, and then when we go into organizations, the way we uh, handle the ethical considerations of others, like ethics are tied to your values, right? You know, I think ethics, like it's almost like I'm going to law school. Ethics is not, it's, a, it's always a gray area. It's driven by what your values are and what, what the, you're driving. It's like if for an organization, if you're consistent with your values and you live your daily life based on that piece, then it's great. But how do we actually uh, implement that? We actually say governance um, governs these areas that that I told you about, like in terms of uh, responsible AI. And the way we implement governance in organizations where technology is moving so quickly is, first of all, you need to keep, give people guidance as to what you can, uh, uh, that what you can and can't do, and 
given that technology is that advanced, I can actually put in guardrails, right? I can automate some of the things like, so I can tell you, don't use solution A, use solution B, right? That could be a guidance, right? The, the, the governance rule is we're not going to have our company's data be used by one of these outside uh, large language model providers, right? And and so that's, that's, the, that's the guidance. Uh, so, so the guidance is, given where these solutions are, don't use solution A, use solution B. That's the specific guidance that we've given. But that's not enough. Then, what, then the guardrails that we've actually put in is, from our machines, from our laptops, from our uh, uh, from, uh, within our environments, we blocked solution A. Right? You know, in terms of you don't, you don't, you, you, like, yeah, we told you. To, what you do in your personal time on your personal devices, that's up to you. But if you're going to be using a corporate device, I'm going to block this one, right? And so that triad of have the right governance, establish the guidance so that people know that this is not us coming in. Like I'm also one of those old IT guys, like us coming in and saying no to everything. No, <laughs> we, we've given you guidance, um, but then here's your uh, – and, and we'll just to make sure we're putting the guardrails in place so that um, – Knowingly or unknowingly, you don't kind of veer away from the guidance we've given you. Hundred percent with you, and I'm glad you mentioned the chipmaker event a couple of days ago because it really struck me this intersection between AI and sustainability. Because the big headlines from that big event were that the chips were thirty times faster, but what yeah. did make all the headlines was that they were 25 times more energy efficient, which is yeah. huge. So looking ahead, what are there any other predictions for the evolving intersection of AI and sustain, sustainability and, and how that synergy might better shape the future of technology, both in business and society too? Yeah. Well, I, I do think, again, um, unfortunately or fortunately, the uh, innovation follows where the money is. Yeah. And so... so uh, you know, part of the reason why, uh, you know, the, the, the current state is where it is, is um, it, it, this all started with graphics processing units, right? Like to be able to do what we're doing with Zoom and others on a screen, uh, your GPUs, you have to manipulate a lot of data very, very quickly. <laughs> you know, a lot of mathematical data, matrix calculations very quickly. That's kind of how this whole GPU thing got formed, saying, yeah, a central processing unit is not that good at doing this, so we need to do uh, something specialized. What started as a specialized chip on motherboards about 15, 20 years ago, uh, people started to say when, when the whole uh, blockchain cryptocurrency thing was a big deal, they started to say, oh, I can now throw GPU farms to go solve this thing, right? And then when that starts crashing, like you start to see the market waver again, and now AI comes over. It's like, oh, wait, I found a new use for GPUs in AI because you need to process this much information. And that's kind of the way I I look at it. There was, they had the right technology for the problem, but it was not a technology that was built for the problem. It's almost like, you know, in the medical field, at least in the U.S., uh, people were told to prescribe aspirin for anyone over 40 years old because it's it helps thin the blood and reduces stroke and things like that. Now they've reversed it, but it's like it, it was not built for that purpose. But it's an off off label use that you that, that that you found for it, and that's kind of what's happened with uh, with the GPU tech. What's changing is people realize that there's a different way to do this extensive math and the speed at which you can do it and how much compute power. You don't have to solve it the same way we solve graphics shows. There's a different way to do it, whether it's tensor units or different places. And so you're starting to see a lot of investment. About four years, four or five years ago, a lot of VC money was going into this because they saw it ahead of time, right? And so uh, I expect to see some really innovative chips come out here very, very soon in the market. That's not going to unseat the leading players, but it's going to give people alternatives and especially people who do care about sustainability and uh, and and want to take the benefits of the AI, they'll have they'll have choices to make, right? Saying, yeah, I can do it this way or I can do it this uh, this other way, and and uh, we drive that. And by the way, like the minute uh, that sustainability thing becomes very big, uh, all the leading chip makers are also going to pivot, right? You know, because they don't want that they're not going to sit back, and and they are doing some pretty cool research in that space uh, to drive it, but. Today, it's just 
um, you know, it, you can sell uh, GPUs to pretty much anyone, right? Like whether they know what they want it for or not, they want a GPU, right? You know, so it's, it's that's 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 the deal. And so like they're playing to the market and more power to them. That's fantastic. Like you know, I'm I'm so we have so many friends who work uh, at at all of these guys, right? Nvidia, AMD, uh, you know, Supermicro, and others that are seeing the benefits of the boom, uh, which is fantastic. And I know that uh, like companies like NVIDIA have got such a great uh, value uh, system. Jensen is just one of the better uh, C- CEOs I've ever uh, had the pleasure to meet. Um, he He's making those investments in sustainability, but it's like, you, I've got this on the back of my truck. I should be able to sell that, but let me make sure I get the next generation ready as well. I absolutely love it. And I'm quite conscious on behalf of business leaders listening all around the world, Keeping up to speed with the pace of technological change and everything that we've talked about today will be quite daunting for many people. And I'm, I'm conti- uh, curious. There's someone right in the heart of the or the eye of the storm here. Where or how do you self educate to keep up to speed with everything? I leverage the tools like that. So I am, I am the AI augmented executive. You know? Yeah. As an example, um, for the last three or four years. I use Grammarly, right? You know, I've used Grammarly and it's been on my desktop, every desktop that I've had. As someone who, uh, where English is not my first language, um, I spent a lot of time creating my first draft and second draft and third draft, even if it was for an email, because you want to get it right. I don't have to worry about it, right? Because that's the, that buys me some time back, right? You know, of things that I used to do before that, it, it has bought me some time back. As technology has evolved, I've stopped using traditional search engines and I go to places like perplexity.ai, right? And perplexity does a lot more detailed search with references and others, and I'm not going to get ads popping up. Right? I pay the 20 bucks and that 20 bucks per month is well worth it because when I need a topic researched, I go there and put my question and I got like, enough for the next uh, five days. So like, it's really... These tools have allowed you to buy back time in your day, right? In your work. Uh, and same thing with uh, with a lot of these things, like whether it's Claude or Chat, Chat GPT or any of those functions. You know, uh, my wife loves the fact that she can plan our trip and get an itinerary by just sitting in front and doing some prompts with her. Right. And, 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 uh, yeah, we're, we're headed out to Malta and Sicily here at least, uh, the, the, in the next month or so. And she's got the agenda already planned. Right. And uh, didn't have to, and, and that took kind of about 30, 45 minutes to interact with the uh, chat GPD to do it. So what it does is if you're smart, if you're literate and you're smart about it, you're buying back time in your day. And then it's a question of what do you do with that time? Um, I, I spend about half of it with my family, like because you don't want to be aware. But the other half, I actually have between six and seven p.m. every day time set aside to learn. Right, so whenever I see something come through, I'll throw it into my inbox. Right, and and, uh, and like six to seven, you open it up, you go do the detailed uh, research on oh, what's this person saying? Right, there's there's a few really thoughtful leaders out there who actually do some phenomenal blog posts. You go read up on them. How are they thinking about it, right? And then you combine that with your 30 plus years of experience, you start to kind of stay current with uh, with things going in. And but, but but back to the question, if I had to learn the tech that's changing every day, might as well give up, right? <laughs> I might as well give up because it's, it, the tech has become so vast and so broad that all you have these days are specialists. Somebody who can do Spark, and even within Spark, they know Apache Spark very, very well. And like, because of these breadth has increased, the only way people start being experts is to is to kind of be more siloed, right? And that's I think AI reverses that. AI starts to reverse that trend that we went down like the last fifteen years, right? Where it's like more and more specialization. You're going to need some of them, but not in the numbers we've needed. When you kind of pull it back and you actually embed AI into this, I can do with far fewer of those, but far more generalists who know how to navigate the broad spectrum of tech. 
Well, I could chat with you for hours about this stuff, but I think that's a beautiful moment to end on. But be- before um, I let you go, for anyone listening, just want to find out more information about Rackspace, maybe explore some of the uh, topics we discussed today. Is there any way in particular you would like to point everyone listening and, and also how they can connect with you? So, first of all, at Rackspace, we are a pure play cloud and AI company, right? And what that really means is uh, we help our customers embrace cloud technologies. Many times it is the public cloud with AWS and Azure and Google. Other times it's our own private cloud because our heritage as a company has been managed holistic. Right? And then when, we, when the internet was new, we were the first to introduce managed hosting, right? When when uh, uh, virtualization was big, we invented OpenStack with NASA. So like this is a company that's got that innovative uh, piece of it. So we have a really good private cloud operation. So we that's all we do. We do public and private cloud and we help customers get there. The other piece that's unique about us is we spend a lot of time um operating the application and operating the data piece. So you gain some very good insights into how to use the AI and others when you see things operate on a day-in and day-out basis. Because if you just have one or two instances of it, it's not a pattern. You can't automate it. But if you can see these things every single day, you can do that. So which is kind of why we launched uh, our SER uh, unit to, to, to focus on AI. So we're that AI and cloud company. And um uh, with the underpinning of that technology DNA that's kind of kept us company. That's that's who we are. Um, our, uh, if you kind of ask any racker who's been here or many of our customers, I'll say we are a we we are known for our fanatical sport. And and fanatical sport to us is put the customer first. <laughs> put, put the customer first and uh, try to solve the problems that like you know when, when they have it. Uh, and even if they don't have a problem, if there's things that you can do to assist, uh, you know, try to do that. And and if you take care of your customer, then the business gets taken care of, right? That That's in a nutshell who Rackspace is. As I said, I run uh, AI and sustainability for Rackspace. I mean, they're CTO, so I have our internal IT and uh, everything else. Uh, working. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I'd say anyone wanting to reach out to me, please do uh, reach out and uh, connect with me. And uh, if you want to find out more about Rackspace, go to uh, rackspace.com uh, or fair.rackspace.com for our AI uh, initiative. So that's that's who we are, right? We'd love to kind of, uh, if you've got uh, challenges adopting the cloud or you have uh, an opportunity where you're looking to leverage AI for for a competitive advantage, come talk to us and uh, we'll put you first because that's, that's what we do. Awesome. Well, I'll get those links added to the show notes so people can find you nice and easily. We covered so much there in a short amount of time from how organizations could start to leverage AI to aid sustainability initiatives, explore some of those new trends emerging when it comes to gen AI workloads, and also the strategic opportunities and a few challenges that arise with the adoption of gen AI. And as I said a few moments ago, we could chat for hours on this stuff, but thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and share some of your insights today. No worries at all, Neil. It was a pleasure. Thank you. I think it's evident that the landscape of technology and sustainability is on the cusp of a significant transformation. And the adoption of Gen AI offers a a promising avenue for organisations to not only enhance their operational efficiency, but also to advance their sustainability goals too. But this is a journey accompanied by a unique set of challenges, from navigating the ethical considerations of AI to fostering a culture of continuous learning and adaptation within the workforce, all to ensure that nobody gets left behind. I think Serene's insights remind me that the path forward requires that delicate balance between leveraging cutting-edge technology and remaining steadfast in our commitment to sustainability. So as we ponder this future of AI and its impact on business and society, one question remains, though. How will we as individuals, as organisations, how will we embrace and adapt to these technological advancements and ensure a sustainable and inclusive future? That's right. 
This is a dialogue, not a monologue. So I invite you to share your thoughts. I want you to join the conversation on how AI can serve as a catalyst for positive change. We've seen the bad stuff. It's all over our news feeds. But let's restore the balance and look how we can find a better way forward. Be the change we want to see in the world. So where do you see the biggest opportunities? Where do you see the biggest challenges in integrating AI with sustainability initiatives? Let's keep this dialogue going and explore together the myriad ways in which technology can foster that better tomorrow that we all want. As always, email me, techblogwriter outlook.com, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, just at Neil C. Hughes. Send me a quick message. Don't just hit the connect button. Tell me you listen to the podcast. It'd be great to meaningfully connect with each and every one of you out there. But that's it for today. So please join me again tomorrow. We'll have another topic that we'll explore together. But thank you for listening today. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Don't be a stranger.